Good morning. It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Pat Sweeney, and I hope that you have had an opportunity to read inside this wonderful keepsake. Our president, Bruce Shire, has written wonderful paragraphs about each of our speakers, and of course, a wonderful one about Pat. And Pat has come to us from Kalamazoo, Michigan, <laughs> And uh, so we're delighted to have you here, uh, leaving the corporate world and becoming an ephemera collector. Um, he specializes in the business of touring entertainers, and he's going to tell us about this wonderful group of people, these ensembles who traveled all over the country without modern modes of communication to keep their businesses alive. And I'm not gonna give any more details, Pat, please. Welcome, Pat Sweeney, thank you. I do, I do also want to mention that Pat has been um, a sustaining member of the Society for a long time. He's contributed to our ephemera news and answered many of the ephemera, what is ephemera questions. And uh, your comment about today is, let's have fun, right? That's what he said. Thank you, Pat Sweeney. Thank you and good morning. I need to stress that uh, what you are about to experience is a far different presentation than the previous two experts have given us. Uh, I do not profess to be that. I am a hobbyist, and as much as we can appreciate the intensive thing we've seen, mine is going to be quite superficial. I'm going to talk about a, uh, uh, an area of ephemera that I find just fascinating, and it, I need to know that it, while I'm trying to cover the period of 1880 to 1920, most of the uh, activity that I'm going to talk about is in the middle 20 years of that. I, uh, I'm struggling with something that I, I'm having trouble how to express. Much of what you are going to be experiencing from me in this presentation, I don't believe. <laughs> now, I realize I have to say that very carefully because I could see an ephemera a society person come up and pull this plug because I don't want to come up here, but I, I'm not lying. I need to stress. So there's two things. One is I'm not going to lie, and the fact that I don't believe some of what you're going to see here, that doesn't prevent you from believing it. You actually might enjoy it more if you did. I don't mean to say I'm skeptical, but much of what is here, let me show you some examples. Here's a set of trade cards for a a uh, rather respectable looking group of entertainers, Snellbacher and Benton. Um, this is from the uh, late 1880s, and here's the back of one of the cards. The greatest of modern amusement enterprises, a colossal, majestic consolidation surpassing in magnitude any and all other attempts ever known. I would have thought I'd have heard about this in elementary school history, okay, but I never had. And the reason they felt they needed to do that is they're competing with these guys, Gus Hill's World of New York Novelties and the New York Vaudeville Stars. And they're claimed to be the two largest and grandest consolidations ever exhibited. Not only that, the Earth's most startling presentations, indisputably the grandest and most gigantic organizations ever perfected. Now, I question that, but again, you are welcome to believe what you're going to see in this thing. Uh, one more example of what I think is an extreme um, is going to come when I talk about vaudeville a little bit later. We're going to hear about a character named uh, Frederick Liddell, who and I uh, call him the vaudeville equivalent of Levi Strauss. You may know of Levi Strauss during the gold era, discovered that he could make money easier selling picks and shovels and pants than he could mining gold. Frederick Liddell had a similar uh, thought, and his approach was that if you sent him $20, he would make you famous and rich. And rather than being a magician, he spent most of his time trying to show people how to get into the vaudeville area. So with those things out of the way, and I'm going to stress, I don't buy this. I would not have sent him the 20 bucks at the time, but you may have. Here's what we're going to look at. We're going to first look at what was the USA like in 1880 at the start of our thing. We're going to look at two types of entertainers, the troops 
of which were the two uh, consolidations we just looked at, and vaudeville acts. These are two quite different approaches to touring entertainers. And what we're going to look at for both of them is the selling job. How did they go about getting their business? And as this era that I'm talking about ends, the influx of circuits and syndicates that are going to change the way these people did their business. And then as we look at 1920, we'll see why this all went away. I also need to stress that uh, there was a question or a letter sent to the Ephemera Society expecting um, some coverage of Chautauqua. And you need to know that we're not going to talk about Chautauqua. I think it's a totally different approach of entertainment. Um, in the case of the Chautauqua people, the, uh, it was much more culturally appropriate than what we're going to talk about. But in 1880, realized no telephone, while the telephone was patented in 1876. It really was, for all practical purposes, unavailable. No radio, no movies, no automobiles, no decent roads. How in the world did these people ever manage to run their businesses? You can think. And again, I want to suggest, by the way, difference from the previous two presentations, if you've got a comment or a question or even a criticism, let's raise it right now. Uh, don't wait until the end. Hopefully, we don't have to cut into too much of, of the timing. So do not hesitate with your uh, contribution to this. So while we did not have any of these five things, and I want to stress they were existence, but in practical purposes, unavailable to the entertainers, at the same time, there were three significant booms happening in the 1880s. Venues were growing up all over the, all over the, the, the uh, country as town halls and opera houses were built. Railroads were booming. And of course, to take advantage of both of those two things, we see this growth of entertainers. It's worth mentioning that in 1870, before this period I'm talking about, was a very significant depression. At the time, it was called the Great Depression in 1870s. By the time our depression in the 1930s came along, they needed a new name. So the 1870s was called the Long Depression. But it was a terrible time in our whole economy. And what we're seeing in 1880, that was over. And the railroads, the venues, and the entertainers to take advantage of them uh, started to grow. So these three booms were really quite synergistic. Obviously, the entertainers would have had to follow uh, the development of both railroads uh, and venues. And speaking of the venues, it's important to realize that they were called opera houses, academies, museums, and atheneums. Rarely were they a theater or a music hall. The thought was if you called something a theater or a music hall, that it was not respectable. So this is where the name uh, uh, Opera House came and was very pervasive. Many of the, the venues that uh, towns built were really town halls or auditoriums. But rarely would you see a, a name in the 1880s and 90s of a theater or a music hall. Heaven forbid that was something no respectable person would go to. And again, I want to stress, if you've got a comment or an addition to this, please don't hesitate to raise it. Okay. Let's go back to the Snellbacher people that we looked at previously. This is one of the trade cards. And I mean to stress that the woman pictured here in bare arms and a short skirt, I'm thinking was probably quite controversial in the late 1880s. On the left-hand side, you see a back of one of the cards. And notice that they referred to the burlesque department. It was a different burlesque than what we now know, but it certainly wasn't respectable entertainment. Um, here's the back of another one of the cards. And I would need to stress this sometime in the late 1880s. I did a little research and could not find exactly when they were touring. And I'm going to uh, do a quick summary to show you what this itinerary of theirs meant. Between August 30th and September 13th, roughly 14, 15 days, this troop of 50 people toured Massachusetts, Connecticut, and New Hampshire. They had one night off in these 15 days, and 10 of them were one-night stands. If you can imagine 50 people moving, they do a performance. They either go back to their hotel uh, in the morning, somehow get to the next venue with all of their costumes and things, and put on the next show. 
My suspicion is that a troop of 50 people of these Snellbachers probably had their own railroad car. Uh, they were big enough to do that. The normal troops of eight to 12 people certainly could not afford their own car. So imagine the difficulty of getting this done night after night, 10 one night stands. They did have one night in Boston. These troops are of several types. The most prominent are the melodramas. These are the plays. The most prominent melodrama that I'm gonna talk about in a second is Uncle Tom's Cabin. There's a book that I uh, read was surprised that suggested during this time there were 500 Uncle Tom Cabins companies. I didn't use that one. That's one of the things I don't believe that there, but that was the, that was the thought. Also, minstrel shows were very common in part of these groups of touring entertainers. Variety shows of the type we just looked at, the Snellbachers consolidation, and then other. There was every imaginable type of entertainment from choruses to bands to choral groups, but this is what we mean by the traveling troops. Let's look a little closer at Uncle Tom's Cabin. These are two posters from uh, Stetson's big spectacular Uncle Tom's Cabin. And I'm gonna highlight this text area on the left. And I can read it to you. Word to the wise in regards to parasites and little pests. Many men enter the show business every year with a single idea of running a snap affair, misleading everybody by falsely advertising getting all the money out of it they can and suddenly lost sight of. These parasites, while infinitesimal and microscopic, are the cause of much annoyance to everyone with whom they come in contact with. They bring discord upon honorable businesses, create distrust in the minds of the people, and tend to degrade. While Stetson's, that's us, constantly aim to elevate, the Stetson Company is as firmly founded and lasting as the Rock of Gibraltar. <laughs> So this is Stetson's view of themselves. The highlight of my interest in this area are the letterheads that these groups used, and they were profoundly important to them because that's all they had to promote themselves from one venue to another. And the next thing I'm gonna show you is a highlight of the lower left-hand corner of that screen. This was very common of these letterheads. The top uh, presented them in the most favorable terms uh, possible. But then they wrote on the left side the things that they had to offer these venues that they were coming to. And notice what these features, including significantly, a street parade. Many melodramas, as well as minstrel shows, they would come into town and have a parade the afternoon of the, of the entertainment. And this is a listing of all the things that Stetson would offer to this venue as they were coming into town. Again, I'm going to ask for this a third time. If you've got a comment, a suggestion, a question as we talk about this, please do not hesitate. Yes, way in the back. The question is, did these productions pay royalties to Harriet Beecher Snow? No, they did not. And it was very controversial. Uh, it was questionable how much uh, protection she had, but as these Uncle Tom's cabins began to just explode, there were no royalties paid to, to Harriet Beecher Stowe. Good question. Anything like that, please do not hesitate your calls, okay? So notice again the street parade and how significant this could be of an entertainer coming into town to get uh, interest and appeal into the community before they put on the show. And thinking of how hard that would be if you only had a one night stand. Put the street parade and everything you had to do and put that back on the train and got to the next hop. Yes, sir. The uh, railroad car was more probable, I think, because I'm thinking, how, how would these people house uh, you know, black uh, entertainers with a, you know, find, stuff to find? So the comment is, how were these people housed, particularly in the case of black entertainers? My guess is that Stetson, as an example, would be large enough to have their own railroad car. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that would be possible for the group of 8 or 10 or 12 people. But that was certainly a, certainly an issue that we have to be contended with. Yes, ma'am. You say, what is Topsy? Topsy is one of the characters. Uh, this is the one of the young girls in Uncle Tom's cabin. So she is one of the characters. And I want to repeat, 
the, one, of the, one of my sources said there were 500 Uncle Tom's Cabin companies touring the country around 1900. I found that questionable, but I chose not to use it. So let's look more at the troops. They were up to 50 people, as you saw, with Snellbachers. More commonly, they were 8 to 12 people. They did mostly one-night stands. Recall on the Snellbachers, they did 10 in a row one-night stands. They were, therefore, they had to move nearly every day. Their most common method of getting paid was a contract with the venue where they split the revenue 70-30. I need to know that they, sometimes I've seen 60-40, I've seen 80-20, but 70-30 was the most, was a common. The entertainer got 70% of the gate, the house kept 30%. So this is, a, as my looking at the, uh, what little history I have from, and you need to know that I have not pursued this in, in uh, uh, to the depth that our previous two speakers have done in uh, collections, but from what I see from my, paper that this split was the, probably the most common method of the entertainer troop getting paid. Sometimes when the troop had good funds, they would rent the house. They would offer that we'll pay you 12 bucks, let us come in, we'll pay you $12 to rent the opera house for the night and we will collect all of the revenue. This was a uh, less common than the 70-30 split. So what they had to do Realize this is a group of, of uh, entertainers always on the road trying to get their business done of a venue and usually some months in advance. So we saw the Snellbacher's trade cards. We saw the Uncle Tom's Cabin posters. Many of they would print their own playbills as well. But they somehow needed to get a contract with the venue. And to me the most interesting part of this is the correspondence between the touring entertainer and the venue on the other side, how did they arrange this, this contract? So here are two examples of what I find the most interesting part of the ephemera, the letterheads of the entertainers themselves. And in the uh, exhibit room, I've got, oh, a dozen of these on display, showing, and these are typical, the top of the letterheads would be promotion of the, of the uh, entertainer, down the left-hand side were endorsements or other features that they would offer. Um, significant that these um, letterheads were somehow of the type that you can see survived af long after the venues themselves had closed or been torn down. In my experience, there are only two opera houses that saved all their letterheads a opera house in Sturgis, South Dakota, and an opera house in Skohagen, Maine. That of all the ones we see today, most of them come from one of those two opera houses. Uh, most, you realize how common these would have been to these in the, in the 1910s or 20s, they would have thrown them away. But these two venues, Skohagen, Maine and Sturgis, South Dakota, were the only two that I have seen have really widely made their letterheads available through, uh, typically through eBay sales. So here's a closer example of the Midnight Flyer. Typical to the promotion notice, an overwhelming, stupendous, magnificent spectacle. This was no place to be shy, okay. Significant that the letterheads that you see today are mostly cut off tops of the letterheads that they would have circulated during the time. So often you see people produced a scrapbook where they had the, excuse me, the cut off tops of letterheads. You also see often blanks, and these were blanks that were left over from the printer. What is rare is to see these letterheads in their original form with the correspondence between the entertainer and the venue. So how did these entertainers get the job? realized they had to first send a letter. I'm talking now the early stages of this 40-year period. They had to send a letter to the venue. They had to get a follow-up because the venue may not have responded to the first one. So there's at least two, two, sometimes three letters saying, hey, we'd like to come to your town and play. And if the 
entertainer got a favorable response from the venue, there would be a negotiation on how they're going to split the results of this thing, either the 70-30 split that I mentioned or the rent. And then they would exchange the contract. All of this done via the mail, and by the mail, and done sometime in advance before the, um, uh, the troop would map out their schedule. And hopefully they could do it with what are called short hops. They only had to move a reasonable number of miles from one night to the other. So here's an example of a letterhead from the homespun heart. And I'll take a closer look at it. It was sent in, uh, in, from St. Albans, Vermont in June 1903. And what's significant, and I'll do a summary of this, it was sent on June 12th to a venue, and they wanted to play sometime between June 22nd and July 22nd. This is very unusual, because this is only 10 days in advance. Usually these letters went out months in advance. Often uh, six months would be not uncommon, but typically three and four months. And what the letter noted, if you'll see on the bottom of this, that the next four nights, from June 15th through the 18th, this is where they are going to be appearing, in Vermont, Enos Falls, Boston, and St. Johnsburg. The significance with this is that if the venue was interested, they would mail back a response to general delivery in these four towns. So I understand, so the, 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 the homespun heart is going to be in these four towns and if the venue was interested, back would come a response by mail to general delivery that they would stop at the post office. The significant thing is you can imagine how this transaction got handled and they never had no connection with each other and depended totally upon the mails to make this happen. I just find the system of the mailing and the general delivery to be uh, remarkable. So often the troop would produce their own uh, playbills. Here are a couple of playbills, and I did, tried to do some research. I could not find any specifics about when or where the Hunt Stock Company was performing these two uh, plays, The Lion and the Mouse and The Little Minister. The significance about these two playbills in my collection, I happened to turn them over one time and saw the penciled results of how these two nights worked. I don't, again, don't know the location, I don't know the exact year, but here's a summary of what those things say. Over the two nights, 1213 and 1214, ticket sales were between 30 and $50. The split is a 70-30, so the house got anywhere from 10 to $15. The company, between 20 and 34, which works out to be two to $3 per person in the company per night. It'd be a long time before you're really going to make much. Surprising, the attendance was only 65 people on the 13th. Um, what little research I've done, this is kind of on the low side in the terms of the amount of money, the return, but a very typical example of how the, uh, the, 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 the uh, troop made their money and how it was the, sp the split between the venue and the troop. Reactions to this? Yes, sir. Did the cost come out, did you say $50 per person? Have you found any evidence that the, the, the company paid for all the other costs? The travel, like room, board, food, all that kind of stuff. So the question is, if this was $2, 2 to $3 per person, how about all the other costs, such as travel? Uh, that certainly is, would be part of this, yes. The 2 to $3 ahead, all I was doing is dividing the 10 people by the total split. So this, this would not be a way for them to uh, be very... Oh, yes, yes. My guess is that in this size troop, 8 to 12 people, this is kind of a partnership. There may, may well not been a superior place. This is just a group of people doing this of, of their own. So I cannot speak what happened to the... Uh, what the t company said, between $22 and $34 between the two nights. This would be a mighty tough way to make a living considering you've got to pay a train fare the next day to get to your new place. Yes, ma'am. The 
question is, is do, we, do I see a difference between the low-grade troops versus the high-grade and the revenue? Yes. So can I interpret your question as this? The, the results of the revenue would depend upon how good the promotion was. And I, I, my, my suspicion is yes. Um, what little I have, I've seen from the reading I've done, there's not too much publicized about how much money they made. Um, there's, uh, when you talk about the, the reminiscences, they talk about, again, like the, Edward, the, the Liddell, fame and fortune. But realize that was more vaudeville. We're still talking here about troops. So I would suspect you're right, the better promotion, but this all depends upon weather, depends upon the size of the venue. So many things would influence the success of this particular night. This particular two nights, uh, and I don't know the year or the location, you'd starve pretty quickly at this, uh, this amount. And realize there was only 65 people on one of those nights. Let us go back to this Ed Anderson's magnificent scenic production. And realize this is one, an overwhelming, stupendous, magnificent spectacle that I invite you to believe if you, ch if you choose. Notice on the bottom, they're referred to the high-class specialties introduced by leading stars of the vaudeville world. Now realize the Midnight Flyer is a, is a troupe. They are going in and they are either going to do a split with the venue or, uh, or rent the thing. Here's another one, Russ Burgess Comedy Company. And right in the middle, you see high-class vaudeville. So these are theater troops. These are correspondents. Notice this was written to Mr. Merrill in Skohagen, Maine, one of the opera houses that saved the stuff. Here's a third one, representative traveling stock organization, a capably, carefully selected company of capable players of Nodville, novel vaudeville features. What I mean to introduce these, these are traveling theater troops who are using in their letterheads their vaudeville credentials. And they are not vaudeville acts. They are, these are touring troops. But what we can see in this, how significant vaudeville was, even though these are not vaudeville acts. Entirely different method of business between the traveling troops and vaudeville. Vaudeville went to a house or a theater that was typically dedicated to vaudeville. They often didn't, they did not split between vaudeville and traveling troops. A typical vaudeville was a bill of seven to 10 acts and all of these acts had a one week stand. I, I, I should back off. Everything I'm saying here is generally accurate. You're certainly gonna find variations from one place to another. And within this seven to 10 acts, uh, st uh, could be acts of every description. We're gonna look closer at some of these possibilities. Uh, it's important to note that vaudeville is an American uh, invention. And you cannot look at vaudeville without spending a few minutes with Benjamin Franklin Keith. Uh, that's him on the left. Look at the lower right, which is the lobby of one of his theaters. Keith did not invent vaudeville. That is normally credited to a guy by the name of Tony Pastor. Um, in the 1880s, roughly started vaudeville. But Keith took it to a whole different dimension. Keith um, is noted for what I'm going to refer to as big time vaudeville. There was a difference between big time and small time vaudeville during this period we're covering. It has to do with big cities versus small cities. Keith was noted for his elaborate theaters. He started in Boston and built one in Boston, then Philadelphia, uh, New York, and Providence. And he's also noted for strict rules that he put on his vaudeville uh, entertainers. Uh, had a list of specific words that were absolutely not to be used Anything that was a questionable behavior, you either got warned one night or you got fired. He made it very important that Keith's vaudeville was respectable because he was going after families. So there was nothing in a Keith vaudeville that was burlesque type that we saw in that earlier venue. He also started continuous. Most vaudeville is noted for a two a day. You had an afternoon set, you had an evening set, 
Keith said, why do that? He went from 10 in the morning till 10 at night, and if you were on one of Keith's vaudeville bills, you may have to do three and four stands because it was continuous, typically 10 in the morning until 10 at night. Um, he's also noted for, he didn't build the palace, but one of the most prominent theaters in the country was the New York Palace. That was Keith's baby. And you know, seated, I think, 3,000 people, a very prominent, big-time vaudeville house. Let's go back to Frederick Liddell. Excuse me. Not yet. Here's an example of a program um, from the Polite Vaudeville in Washington City. A very typical example. Uh, this is from 1900. And what I want to show you on this one, the uh, middle, the left-hand side is a page that is from which the bill has been moved over to the right. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven typical acts. And the way these were organized is that the top uh, lead in act was typically a very low grade um, act of little consequence, as was the last act. The sixth or the seventh were meant to be the highlights. And the top act that you see there is the four Cohans in 1901. This was the George M. Cohan family. George M. was the youngster in this family. And to be here as the opening act meant that they were clearly at the bottom of the pile. The opening act and the ending acts were kind of throwaways, all leading to the Ramaza and Arno, which is to be the highlight. So more on vaudeville, a big difference between city and country. The city, places like the palace where you had a, a, a capacity of 3,000 to the small town vaudeville. The difference between two a day, which was normal, versus continuous that B.F. Keith started. And you remember the uh, poster that we saw from um, Frederick Liddell, which I'll get to more in a second. But a typical vaudeville act could earn $100 to $500 a week or more. The high spots in the big time vaudeville in big cities could be much more than that. And especially the difference between an opening act versus a headline act. Any reactions to the vaudeville? Any suggestions or comments? Comment in the back. Yes, sir. <laughs> Repeat that. I can't hear that. Now, is that the same as your Fred Niblo? Oh, unrelated, okay. I did, I did not notice that. Unre unrelated to what we, our previous uh, experience was about. Huh. Oh, thank you. I, I did not know that. Appreciate it. Rita, this is the son of the Niblo of which we just heard. Oh, it worked. We uh, previously looked at Frederick Liddell, who I described as the Levi Strauss of vaudeville. And here's what uh, he promoted. And what's interesting is I have all of his books that for 20 bucks, which is the equivalent of $250 today, you really did get some very significant um, uh, assistance in getting your vaudeville act off the ground. Um, and he did promise or let's say suggested fame and fortune, but I'm not sure how many people got that. But what he did offer was a series of books, nine in total, everything from how do you decide what you want to do, how do you develop your personality, how, how important your letterhead is, how you conduct yourself on the stage. And he really did quite a, to me, by looking at it a century later, a pretty reasonable job of introducing vaudeville uh, to these fledgling entertainers. So who are some of these fledgling entertainers? Next few slides are some examples of what I think are the ephemera gems and what really has me, um, I guess what really triggered my interest in this. So they could range from families. Here's a family of five Olivers. And notice that Mr. Guy Oliver is a whistling phenomenon. The whole family are Swiss bell ringers and the Oliver sisters are vocalists and dancers. 
So what you've got here is a family of five who are going on the road. I don't know how the kids ever went to school if they did, but an example of somebody that Frederick Liddell sold into have your family go and be expert bell ringers and specialty artists. Or you could become a contortionist. This is George R. Riley, the human stake, refined and amazing contortion poses, rare exhibitions of human flexibility. Now notice at the bottom of this top of this letterhead, there's no mention of either the time of the act or the term closing, which I'm going to express in just a second. So here's another opportunity of a husband and wife, I would think, or a family, brother and sister, Lyons and Bertie Allen. So they presented musical comedy. Notice on the left, neat and refined. If you're in vaudeville, you're not supposed to do anything that's questionable that would not be respectable to a family. Notice on the lower right corner is the en route. That's what we saw with the troupe. Wherever they sent this thing looking for work at the next vaudeville house, that's where they were, and the responder of the venue had to go to the um, uh, general delivery at the next towns that they were working in. Another example of Hyde and Heath singers and comedians. Singing, dancing, six changes of costume, great military and electrical finish. So it's the Hyde and Heath supported by Alice Walsh. Notice at the lower left corner, time of act, 17 minutes. Sometimes they were specific, other times they left it blank. So this is letting the venue, the, the vaudeville operator know how long your act was. Typically 12, 17, I've not seen anything longer than 20. And here's just two girls, the sisters Faye. I'm wondering what, how their parents ever managed to <laughs> support them as a vaudeville act. Just two, they look to be uh, barely teenagers. Notice the time of act is, is uh, what, 10 to 14 minutes. And it's called Works in One, which I need to express. The stage of a vaudeville house had four um, ranges on which the act would be. The contortionist or the um, the contortionist or the um, vaudeville um, uh, entertainers that used a whole stage would take up the whole stage and it would take time for their act to get set up. So what the house manager needed was acts that could work in front of the curtain. That was called one. So while they were out there doing their 12 to 14 minutes in one, in the back, the paraphernalia was being set up for the trampoline artists or the wire walker or whatever they were. So the Fay sisters were, could run, um, they're calling a routine of original buck and wing dancing. One of the problems I've had in my research, and I did not go to to the libraries and museums to see much of this, is getting the whole picture of any particular act, what their letterheads were, what their finances were, what they did. I did succeed in getting a couple of, of files back, but I could not get, in the case of Martini and Fabini, I never found their letterheads. But this was, this was a husband and wife dancing act that was quite prominent from about 1905 to 1915. And what I did get of them are their contracts, uh, probably a dozen contracts. And notice this is Martini and Fabini who are appearing on the Wilmer and Vincent circuit. This is from January of 1914, and they made $150 for the week, the two of them. Here, significantly, is also Martini and Fabini, but they're at, on the Keith's circuit. And this is only the second time we've heard about a circuit, which I'm going to get into that in a second. So they also, this is from 1913, they made another $150. Well, let's spend back on B.F. Keith and wow, how we put this circuit together. And remember, this was Keith, who was the big-time vaudeville operator in big, in big eastern cities. He partnered with a guy by the name of Ed Albee, and he did have multiple city venues. He did... Uh, was noted for paying quite good rates, 100 to $500 a week or more. And he's the one that identified the difference between the opener and the headliner. 
Because if you had continuous acts, what you wanted to do was get your audience turn over. So the first and the last act on the program were kind of marginal, and that's when people would come and go, is they would want to be there for the prime acts, especially leading up to the headliner. At the same time that Keith was deciding there's an opportunity in syndicates, there was a group of theaters in the West under the name, general name of Orpheum. Now, you could think of how easy it would be in the East to have hops because of the close proximity of one city to another. You couldn't do that in the West. And also, you couldn't get there easily. There was not much going on in Kansas or Nebraska. So to get to, get to the West, what Orpheum did was realized we need to get a, an, whether it was, this was vaudeville now, to come out to the West and we will guarantee you a series of jobs. And that's how a circuit got started. So the Orpheum connected with a vaudeville entertainer and they went from San Francisco to Seattle to Los Angeles, shorter hops. And this is where the concept of a circuit started. The significance of circuits and syndicates, realize we were I mean, talking about the, the difficulty of getting jobs, whether it's a troupe or a vaudeville entertainer, to had to write to every one of these venues in advance. Keith in the East Coast, Orpheum on the West, realized that there's a, maybe an opportunity here. And what they did was created an arrangement with the venues. In the case of vaudeville, it was Keith and Orpheum, but on the theatrical side, Claw and Erlanger, that they arranged the, the uh, whole season's work. And they could book a whole season, either vaudeville or theatrical. They took a 5% cut off the top. And they became quite controversial because they really became in control of these acts. And it was much easier, of course, for the venue to turn over their operation to either Claw and Erlanger, if you were bricking troops, or to uh, Keith Orpheum, if you're doing vaudeville. What this also meant is that the syndicates or the um, circuits had tight control over who they wanted to play and what their conditions were for, for getting their 5% cut. This was written up very interestingly in a new book, Vaudeville Wars, how Albie and Orpheum controlled the big time in its performance. And it materially changed the whole concept of how vaudeville worked. So an example, this is a front cover of the vaudeville news and notice as a page this is now when Keith and LB and Orpheum all connected so they joined in one group and truly controlled vaudeville across the country and they could put out a calendar like this that showed in all of the different theaters that they had what the different acts were and it made a huge um, impact upon the uh, let me say the freedom of the acts and they really ended up managing the vaudeville world. So we turned to what the world was like. We looked at what it was like in 1880. By 1915 and 1920, we had radio, we had movies. Certainly now we had telephone, we had automobiles, we had buses and highways. And the conditions that led to the troops that we looked at as well as uh, the start of vaudeville were totally different. And the world changed materially. But we can't leave without looking once more at B.F. Keith. I mentioned that he had partnered with Orpheum. He somehow found his way to Joe Kennedy. Don't ask me how that ever happened. And Joe Kennedy, this is the Kennedy family, who was a principal in the Radio Corporation of America. And that's what RKO came from, Radio Keith Orpheum. I didn't know that, I was amazed to discover that on this thing. So RKO, the movie, was radio from Joe Kennedy, K for Keith or Orpheum. And when the world of touring entertainers kind of ended, they decided to get in the movie business. And I end the story with a remarkable history. That's how Howard Hughes got into the movie business by buying RKO. Can you imagine that? <laughs> I got a question there, yes ma'am. Yes, yes. The question is, in New York, there was a movie theater, the RKO Keith. So Keith had his name in there twice. 
He's the K for Keith, and he also was the end of the RKO Keith. Yes. Yes. The question is, did the First World War stop touring companies or have a difference? It certainly had to have an impact. Um, 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 but I want to stand, one of the things, that's another area that I work in. The First World War ran from, uh, was it 1912, 1913? The U.S. did not get into that until late in 1917, and we were done by 1918. So we had a rather small participation, actually, in the war but certainly it had an effect on people's, people's connections. Yes, sir. Is it fair to say that this type of intrigue puts you as a melting to the inner part of yourself? The question is, did... Now did that it's yours again, sure. it feels nothing like it. The question is, did this morph into the Ed Sullivan show and now there's nothing like it? The vaudeville people claim that, yes, there was a natural extension of the, of the Ed Sullivan type, uh, inter, you know, multiple entertainment. And including in the early days of, of the Ed Sullivan, it was the late end of the life for many of these vaudeville entertainers. But true, there is nothing like that today, uh, except possibly late night may be a part of it. But that's a good, good point. Yes, ma'am. So the question is the crossover between vaudeville and, uh, and va Carnival. car and carnivals. It's a, I don't. I can't speak to that. Not my, myself. I could expect there'd be some synergy, but none that none that I personally am aware of. Don't forget, I'm an amateur in this. Okay, I'm an amateur hobbyist. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> it's a, sty a style of dancing, I assume. I cannot speak to any knowledge about that either, but it's a type of dancing. Yes. Quiet, please. Repeat that, please. Um, can I just give you a, a question is how m of the peak of the opera houses, how many were there at the peak and how many, how many are left? Uh, I know that number exists. The uh, book that I mentioned that who talked about, maybe I have a cover of the history here. Uh, a recent book called Local Glories, um, which is where the mention of 500 Uncle Tom's Cabin companies uh, and I, sorry, I cannot cite the specifics, but in this book are very specific um, uh, statistics of how many opera houses were developed, how many venues were developed, most of which were opera houses, but I, uh, I don't recollect the number. Yes, ma'am. Uh, first of all, can you switch over and recognize that? Yep. Eight or, uh, well, that's two. There was, he did it at various stages. I have nine, but it was commented. The question is how many booklets Frederick Liddell had in his book, uh, and most of the promotion refers to eight, but eight or nine uh, about not books. Thank was another, yes, ma'am. question is about Uncle Tom's Cabin and question, were the black characters played by black people or were they white people in blackface? And when did the blacks uh, come? And the question is, when did the blacks come? I can't answer that. I bet somebody else can, though. Who knows about Uncle Tom's Cabin? Certainly, I think your point is in the, in the early stages, there's no way that, a, that an African-American could be in his touring company. Uh, so it had to have been a white face. But what happened later, I don't know. Yes, sir? I'm the one who wrote about the Chautauqua. Oh, are you? Okay. <laughs> and, and it's funny, people want to, there's two different aspects of it. There's actually the main Chautauqua 
Yep. Yep. And then the touring. Yes. That was just like me. It was yep. just this is their kit. And yeah, they were a little more a little more up it's not upscale, but more proper. But still they were music and uh, whereas this the formal kit off the place had more almost classical music and pieces. But they all had But it was also but the Shatak was cultural. Yeah. It, it made So interesting, his, his was the letter to the Ephemera Society hoping to hear more about Chautauqua in my talk, and I had to apologize that. But Chautauqua is a higher class presentation than what, we were, what I was making a case of here. And the moving of the Chautauqua was in a tent, and it was one week in a community, and they went on to do the next one of the Red Path. Sir, uh, yes. Yes, sir. Question is on these spectacular letterheads, uh, how did they get them? Who paid for them? Uh, by the way, uh, uh, both of us have displays of these letterheads back uh, down the hallway. I don't know. That's a good question. It's never occurred to me. Maybe you have an answer back there, sir? But realize the most ornate of the letterheads were the vaudeville. So this is just a small act. Uh, that'd be an interesting question that I uh, have not pursued what they cost for. May I thank you for your kind attention and participation. Nice being with you.